We do. <laughs> so hopefully everybody consents to being recorded. This is being recorded. Um, so I'm starting again. This is I'm Gabby Conacher. Welcome. Uh, um, it's good to have folks who've been with us before. Um, and if you're new, um, I'm co-founder of Deep Connections, which is a project um, of about 30 patient advocacy groups working together to bring resources to families who have children with severe epilepsy and many comorbidities, also known as developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. So um, we're really excited about this series that we're starting kicking off today with um, on technologies to help manage seizures. And um, we have a panel who are gonna help us um, experience or a better understand the experience as both a um, caregiver using tracking tools and as a healthcare provider um, receiving that information and using actually usually data to make decisions, which is really <laughs> um, an incredible shift, um, I think for a lot of us um, to think about as um, I know with my son, a lot of the care has been, you know, uh, without, without tracking seizures has been much more, you know, throw spaghetti at the wall and see what works. Um, and when you use data, um, particularly based on your, your child's experience, it really to helps to, to build a stronger case for each uh, move. So I want to note that um, this series we um, planned and is being co-hosted by Rob Moss, who developed Seizure Tracker. Um, not in any way is it to um, exclusively say Seizure Tracker is the way to go, but um, we went to Rob because he really is a leader in pushing forward um, the and pushing the boundaries really of what tracking can look like and how it can be integrated um, and utilized to um, really you know he's got the he's got experience as as a parent of a child with epilepsy um, and you'll hear from him in just a minute but to get started <clears throat> let's start with you Nancy um, and Nancy is um, I'm excited because we have a, this whole group that you're seeing here, <laughs> there's a lot of life between these parts, right? So Nancy, um, Nancy's son, MJ, who's 10, is seen by Dr. Hughes. And Dr. Hughes has worked with Rob for what, almost 15 years now on the development of Seizure Tracker and building it as a tool that is more useful for um, providers and families. So Nancy, we'll start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience um, with tracking seizures and, and why you feel that it's been really helpful for you and MJ's care? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> just to take everybody back a little bit, I just would like to begin with saying uh, my son was diagnosed about eight years ago with epilepsy. So we've been on this journey for a while. Um, when we first began, I used um, notepads and um, sent lots of emails and took lots of pictures or tried to send a lot of different types of communication. But I mean, the the way we, I wrote things was I dated it every day and I had I have notepads. I still have them probably of a lot of that stuff. And um, the, the thing is, is that you have to capture it when it's fresh. Um, because you might forget some meaningful points. So I think it's very valuable to have um, all of that with you at the time when you begin tracking. Um, and sometimes it's easy to forget when you don't write it in the book or anything. Um, so then we were introduced to Seizure Tracker not too long after that. And it's more of an electronic way to track his seizure activity. And one of the things that was most valuable for us was um, we were able to go in and put the information in right away. And we were able to kind of keep ourselves in check by identifying different, whether it's the type of seizure, the length of the seizure, the time of the seizure, um, you know, what was happening at that time. So our, you know, being able to electronically track it at that moment in time became very helpful for us. And we started to pick up a pattern where we became consistent with our tracking rather than having the notes. So that, um, was really, really, really valuable to us. 
probably the hardest part for us was just remembering to get on the app, uh, get on there right away. And it was just like a discipline for us. And the other part was just learning how to use it um, functionally and kind of just get used to all the detail that it provided. And as we did that more and more frequently, our, we started to flow because we also were able to put the medicines in there, the medications. And um, I don't know where you, all of you, but we've trialed several medications. So we were able to identify like what dose he's at and we've been able to do all that. The other thing um, is we were able to really identify what we were looking to track um, and doing without having that electronic way of doing it. You know, there might be some things that were more valuable to track and less things that maybe might not be so valuable to track. Uh, more recently, we've started to use, um, and I'm looking down at my notes because I don't want to forget anything because there's so many good things here. Um, more recently, we've started to use, well, over the past couple of years, our phone. And then we can go ahead and input the event right away and the availability to also capture a video and upload that as well. Um, I haven't used that so frequently, but it is possible because in the past, like I said, we would take videos that maybe couldn't be sent via email or however else we wanted to send it. But that is a great um, tool and it being able to put it, have it on my phone and upload the events and still have it on my PC is really helpful. Um, and the other thing too is we, like I went back to the various medicines. So as we continue to trial and build and reduce and work through different medicines, you, I go in there and I update it and I update it so I can look at it. And I, I really use it like a calendar. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's been really helpful when I'm like, if somebody says to me, did you guys ever try this medicine? I mean, after years and years and years, and you might've tried different things through epilepsy that truly can become like a whole reference point for you using the seizure tracker. So the other thing that really became important is we began to be able to track patterns and periods of different changes for my son. So maybe his seizures changed at a certain time. Maybe he was having this type of seizure compared to this type of seizure. Was it the medication? Were there outside influence factors? And also what age was he? What was going on in his life? I mean, even so much, sometimes I am convinced that full moon affects it. You know what I mean? The, there's so many variables, but I can still go into the seizure tracker and say that, that tool to say, um, you know, this was going on, this might invite that and it, it really opens up a lot of opportunity so the other thing we uh no, grabbed onto was we were able to start putting life events other than just seizures in there so he had new teeth coming in or um he had a very rare busy not rare but a very busy type of day at school that might have thrown him off that might go with that event that we're trying to look at um Overall, it's been a really great guide to capture anything, but I think functionally it ha you, you're able to adjust it to what is gonna work specifically to your need. And we found that. Um, and then the biggest victory we've had with it is our communication. <laughs> um, and that's our ability to communicate with our writer, which is Dr. Hughes um, about his my son's events. So I don't have to send her a lengthy email because I can just put this information right into the toolkit and then I can send her a message and say, this is updated for your review. We're having this or, you know, um, I feel like the, uh, and then Dr. Hughes can go in and look at the medications. She can look at maybe we're not doing something consistently right or maybe she's gonna pick up on a pattern that of something that's happening. Like, oh, I see he changed schools. I see that he's been, you know, um, having ear infections and maybe that could be a contributing factor. So we're able to kind of network on things that could be causing it without um, without maybe having to go to an appointment, without maybe having to um, have lengthy conversations or wait for a phone call. We can kind of use that as a, a great communication device as well. And I think that's really some of the biggest victories that we've had. Um, I, like I say, I go back to probably the most difficult thing was the transition and just getting used to the flow and the discipline of making sure you put it in pretty quickly after the event happens so you capture what you need. And that is pretty much everything that I have. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was really helpful. Um, and I look forward to, as we're talking a bit more 
hearing a little bit more about um, what's what's changed as a result of all of this and how it's it's helped in MJ's care. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Hughes can speak to that as well, which is exciting. Okay, so Rob, I'm going to invite you to come back. Oops, I'm... Hmm. Okay. Rob, are you there? I am. I, um, I can't start my video. It says, I think it's a uh, host control. Well, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I have to go in here just a second. That should do it. I hope. Yay. Sorry, that was probably something I pushed. Um, so I'm excited to bring my co host up here on the screen uh, with me. So Rob Moss is not only a, um, the parent of a, a child who has tuberous sclerosis complex, um, but who has really worked in the, um, the seizure space looking at uh, innovating for many years, I think, uh, was it 15-ish years or so? Mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> um, and is the co-founder of seizuretracker.com, um, which is a comprehensive online seizure diary um, and that is really focused on patient-doctor uh, connection and communication. Um, and so Rob, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your drive to do this, um, what what you do at seizuretracker.com and because um, I know you're, I don't, can't think of anybody who's uh, as deep into this space for to help families and, and providers really better communicate about seizures and um, yeah. Yeah, th thanks Gabby. First of all, thanks so much for um, uh, providing the opportunity to share this information and us to be able to co-host uh, with 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 you all on on this important um, topic. So uh, our son Evan, who's 17 now, as as Gabby mentioned, has tuberous sclerosis complex and uh, has struggled with seizures since birth. Um, as Nancy mentioned, uh, you know, we all were collecting information in ways and then trying to communicate that with our care providers to make, uh, you know, less subjective decisions about therapy. So we, um, as Evan was growing and uh, had been diagnosed with epilepsy, we were working towards uh, getting his seizures under control and would come into uh, the doctor's office with books and notepads and everything and then really struggle to communicate that information with um, his care providers to make those decision changes. Uh, you know, right around the time Evan was three, we started collecting his data in a rudimentary website that we had built ourselves and then started graphing it through this free graphing component. And taking that into our doctor, uh, he asked us to, to make that website public. So in 2007, we launched seizuretracker.com. Um, it's now the largest database of seizure activity in the world. Um, and we, you're able to capture, as Nancy mentioned, um, seizures through the mobile app, the, the seizuretracker.com, the website, and also by voice through Amazon Alexa. What's been really exciting about um, uh, joining this community in the way we've had is um, and and building this resource for not only us but other families and and individuals living with seizures and epilepsies. Um, it we've moved into this space where having a data set this big has allowed us to to understand epilepsy much differently, um, and there was a lot of interest with the research community. So. Uh, we uh, had been being approached by researchers within the community for years and really wanted to focus on empowering 
our users at Seizure Tracker to collect, own, and share data as easily as possible. And we didn't want to lose that user confidence and, and that mission. So the research part of this was secondary, but in 2014, we developed a system that we felt comfortable would be able to share data um, uh, with a focus on privacy and we're able to then start a relationship with the epilepsy research community. Um, that's been very productive and uh, really understanding epilepsy and, and uh, we can talk a little bit about um, how that's progressed into to some of the research ideas and stuff we've been publishing on uh, through the seizure tracker data. Also this idea of owning your data and sharing it um, uh, came along and really pushed us into working with other um, folks in the epilepsy community who were collecting similar data. So we co-founded uh, an organization called the International Seizure Diary Consortium, which really focuses at, at standardizing this type of data um, and empowering us as um, care providers and families living with seizures uh, to own that data and share it with other tools. So the International Seizure Diary Consortium published a, a common data elements document that basically looked at multiple seizure diaries and said, what are what is everyone collecting and how do we standardize that really to empower um, us as, as electronic users to be able to share that across uh, systems. Um, on top of that, we had a focus of uh, within that research um, idea, being able to take your seizure tracker data and combine it with other data sets. Um, and we were able to build a data share partnership program that allows um, our users and to combine their data with other data sets. And most importantly, I think is the communication between uh, people living with epilepsy and their care providers and being able to collect the data and share it and then make informed decisions about therapies. As Nancy mentioned, that was so important to us um, as we were going through those medication changes to make sure we could collect and share that data efficiently. So that was um, one thing that we've really built into our system and, and try to impress upon people that how important that is to us as, as patients and care providers. So Gabby, that's about um, uh, all I have on the seizure tracker background. Um, I'm, I, I have the pleasure of introducing Ina, I think, um, uh, Dr. Hughes. And uh, Gabby mentioned that we've been working with Dr. Hughes for years. I, I should clarify that uh, really that's been um, us uh, putting seizure tracker out there and collecting as much feedback as we could from the community. And it's so important to make to us to make sure that it's usable across the clinical space and, and um, by our users themselves. So Ina has been very frank with the feedback over 14 years. I should introduce her as a pediatric uh, epileptologist at uh, Rochester or University of Rochester medical facility group. So in Rochester, New York, um, she is, uh, has impressed us with her knowledge of all things electronic and patient management. I have uh, always enjoy our conversations because it's very clear that she cares about the people and connecting with the people that she um, is caring for as a physician. So Dr. Hughes, I will hand it over to you and um, uh, let you uh, imbue your knowledge on us about all things uh, seizure diary wise. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Robin. And thank you for all of the things that you have created that have helped our patients so much. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. I have a, a slide set. The majority of my slide set is a place to rest your eyes while I blather. Um, and I do tend to talk very quickly and I apologize for that, but it's mostly because I'm excited about what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, so what I wanna talk about today, of course, is, is extending on what Nancy and uh, Gabi and uh, Fushrav have talked about, about that idea of why tracking epilepsy changes can help you in your epilepsy journey. 
And so hopefully these slides will actually work. So the one of the biggest and most important things is going into any kind of patient care is that um, is that uh, whenever you go into talking to your doctor, there is a big difference between what is important to you and what is important to your doctor. And both of those things are really important to be communicated at the time of the clinic visit and when you are talking to your doctor at any point. It's because there are going to be things that are, are different about the epilepsy that are going to be things that you want to communicate. And there are so many of them. And particularly when you're newer to epilepsy and particularly when you are um, particularly when you are also overwhelmed with the epilepsy, when it is coming at you so quickly, when changes are occurring, when things are happening and seizures are changing, um, knowing what it is that changed in that moment is often hard to kind of hold on to, to keep track of, unless you are putting it, writing it down, unless you are gifted with a huge memory um, that isn't distracted and overtired and thinking about 10,000 things at once, being able to then communicate that information in a consistent manner to the to your doctor who really wants to just find a way to have a giant data dump from your head to theirs um, is always going to be a difficult thing and so you want to make sure that you both collect the data and think about the data that's important to be conveyed at the clinic visit to your doc but what's really important to you as well um, one of the things that uh, Nancy has certainly heard and pretty much all of my patients that I work with is that from an epileptologist standpoint, epilepsy only gives us two rules. One, seizures are subject to change without notice and epilepsy is a jerk. And so thinking about those two things, what information do we actually need to try to make decisions about how best to care for someone with epilepsy? And what information do we need to kind of put together? So what really matters? We talk about seizure counts and seizure counts are fantastically important, but there can be a difference in what seizure types you're experiencing too. Is, you know, five myoclonic brief individual jerk seizures as bad for someone as a 10 minute long generalized convulsions? We know that that's not, that those are not equivalent things, but if you're looking at just seizure counts, five seizures is technically worse than one. And so you need to be able to collect both of those pieces of information and um, need to be able to experience them as well. What did you need to do about those seizures? Did someone need to give rescue medication? Was there a recent change in seizure medications that might have triggered this change or might have improved the overall seizure count? Was a child exposed to triggers or was an adult exposed to triggers? Things like flashing lights or illness or big changes in their sleeping patterns. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we find as we collect more information about our patients, that it's actually the medication that itself is causing the problem, that a medication or a therapy change leads to a difference in how a person is feeling that then changes how frequent their seizures are. Are there differences in seizures that take you to the emergency room versus those that don't? For our patients who um, so experience menstrual cycles, are their menses affecting their seizure frequency? And in fact, many of my patients will tell me that the phases of the moon do in fact seem to have an impact on their, their child's epilepsy or their, their family member's epilepsy. And so sometimes even keeping track of that can be a helpful thing as well. And as I said, this is just a huge amount of information besides just, you know, how are you doing today? What's going on? How is your child's epilepsy? How is your child, you know, how are PTOT speech school, EI, all of those things going at the same time? keeping track of those things becomes really difficult. So then how do you manage to do that? And many of my patients, when I first started um, in care for epilepsy, that idea of just writing something down to let me know how many seizures were happening at a time and whether if we made an impact on a change in dose of medicine, if we changed the timing of a medicine, whether or not it, it helped, um, that first step of just writing stuff down and getting it into a consistent place often meant that people were using things like um, just writing it on a plain or regular calendar or printing out something like an epilepsy frequency calendar. Um, many of my families recognized pretty early that the complication um, that uh, many different things impacted epilepsy meant that they were keeping these complicated books and notebooks and multiple notebooks and dad would have a notebook and mom would have a notebook and school has one. 
Um, and then I've also had multiple families come in with just piles of post-it notes and little scraps and pieces of paper and hand them to me and cycling through those things to help to try to figure out what's really important and what's impacting someone's seizure frequency and their quality of life is always really tough to do, but we do it because no matter what, we have more data than we would have without it. So um, there have been a couple of different studies shown uh, that it, it, even before uh, Rob and his team um, created the Seizure Diary Consortium, uh, this goes back to all as far as 2014, about what's kind of important to be in a seizure diary if we're talking about an electronic format or if we're talking about a, um, a non-paper-based format. So many will often include things like general information. How do you manage your epilepsy? What are the kind of important things to, to write down? Even actually just particularly for new epilepsy families, having a list of what the creators of the epilepsy diary thought was important to write down helps them to even organize their own thoughts and organize their own experience as they're having it. Um, many of us don't think about things like lifestyle triggers. One of the biggest ones that I can say in pediatric epilepsy that almost nobody thinks about but is incredibly important for our kids is constipation. Our kids get constipated, they seize more. It has lots to do with stressors to the body, how meds are moving around the system, how different things are being uh, metabolized. Um, but it's a lifestyle factor and a trigger that we will often see infection and illness, ear infections, um, changes to diet, changes to other people's medications. When I say other people's, I mean other, other body elements, other doctors that are giving meds like reflux meds that can change the way anti-seizure medicines are absorbed. Um, keeping track of things like CC and seizure first aid and medication treat changes, which doctors are doing which things is really helpful. And then of course the seizure diary and the medication records because it is hard to keep track, particularly if your child is on more than one medication of what changed when. And then when you take a 10,000 foot view, particularly for those who are living with epilepsy every day, taking that 10,000 foot view and scaling back and seeing, oh, two weeks ago when we changed the ONSI, things were worse. And now, yes, we're still seeing seizures, but they're better that slow gradual change because you're living in it every day is sometimes hard to see without that hard data of seeing yep over the course of the past month we've gone from 16 seizures a week to three seizures a week um, and sometimes it, it actually takes that external view to be able to identify those changes um, and then some of our uh, uh, of the available um, available programs will allow for actually video recording of the seizures I have to admit that over my now uh, 15 years in child uh, neurology uh, as a trainee and now as an attending, um, the biggest advance and one of the best things for us in both epilepsy care, movement disorders care, kind of any major neuro child neurology has been the fact that we are now all walking around with video cameras in our pockets. Um, the fact that we can take a picture of a, the video of a child once we know they're safe, of course, and a seizure to show how a seizure is moving and progressing across someone's body has been a massive aid in helping to identify new seizure types, changes in seizure semiology, changes in how uh, a person's seizure is affecting their body. Um, back in 2014, this particular paper from uh, Pandar and Bolar identified many different available seizure management applications. Um, these were available kind of worldwide, um, which is one of the reasons why the, the uh, um, how much they cost is uh, in Australian dollars. Um, that required or uh, provided a bunch of different op options. So the ones that I'm going to talk with you guys about uh, are just some general and simple comparisons over a few of these different options. So paper. Theoretically, paper is free uh, unless you're buying very fancy like moleskin notebooks and things. Um, the tough thing is that for paper, there's no real compatibility to computers or your phone. Um, there's no built-in, you know, inherent patient education in them. You can self-monitor, you can choose the information that you put in it very easily, like if you're going to have medications, those sorts of things. And you can share it with your team. For instance, we have many Mennonite and Amish patients um, that work with our center that utilize paper-based uh, seizure tracking, and they will bring a copy of their seizure tracking uh, a calendar with them to our clinic visits, and we copy them and make sure that they're in the chart, and then we summarize them into our patient notes. Um, some families will do things like create complex spreadsheets 
for um, electronic calendars. Um, I have some young patients who themselves will keep just a running notepad note in their phone um, detailing their seizure frequency and their seizure dates. Those are often difficult to share with us, but they we still find a way um, and they can have different uh, um, different availability. For one of my young patients who keeps track of his seizures every single couple of days when he had first had them, he accidentally left his phone at home um, on the way to the clinic visit. And so he then had to try to recover from memory what was on his phone um, and then had to email it to me later. So we still had a way to share it, but it was it was tougher in the moment in the clinic visit. Um, so the other, the other um, programs that I'm going to talk with you guys about, Seizure Tracker, My Seizure Diary, Epi Diary, and Epi, uh, Epsi, excuse me, um, have options for uh, inherent to them uh, patient education and information, availability of self-monitoring, um, ability to monitor medication changes, and some ability to share uh, with different uh, programs in your team in different ways. So. Um, I have absolutely loved working with uh, Rob since I first got to meet him. I think it was uh, actually 2011 when I first got to meet him at my first American Epilepsy Society meeting. Um, and um, through him, I have learned so much about what it is important for families to be able to communicate, um, not just um, uh, not just what is important for me to understand as an epileptologist, but what families want to be able to communicate. Um, so Seizure Tracker, um, you guys have already heard about, uh, it has the ability to evaluate both video as well as to collect uh, specific information um, on um, seizure frequency and um, seizure types. It is, has availability with Apple, Android, and Amazon. And um, sorry, I'm just watching the chat as well. Um, and has the ability to then document for each of the days of the week and multiple times during a day, if someone has multiple seizures in a day, um, the medications that they were receiving, if they missed meds, if they needed rescue meds for kids on ketogenic diet or other dietary therapies, there are tools to record things like ketones, there are tools to record things like blood sugars if those have been disrupted, um, and then uh, ability to just maintain notes. Um, if someone has a vagus nerve stimulator, you can document when the magnet was used, you can document when there have been changes to the, um, to the settings, which is for long, slow therapies like ketogenic diet and the VNS can be fantastically important because the changes that you make today may not be felt in the person with epilepsy for another week, another two weeks, another month. But when they finally peak and become effective, then patients may be able to, then you might be able to really assess the efficacy of that therapy. Um, one of the things that I want to show you guys is that uh, my view as a physician is actually through something called the Valet system for this particular uh, uh, program. And um, I, this is my example account of, uh, of, that I utilize with our patients to show them how it works. Um, and uh, I haven't updated my example patient seizure frequency for a while, I apologize. Um, but it allows us to, um, for you to just see like a, a shared number of good days versus bad days. Um, it also lets you see um, things like appointments. Um, it lets you see uh, information about uh, different patient care. So one of the things, uh, and Nancy, I hope you don't mind that I share this with, um, for uh, MJ, Nancy's son, is that um, Nancy and her husband document very clearly what happens in the progression of a seizure. And those over time, over MJ's lifetime, have actually shifted. And it's actually been, um, and it's helped us to know seizures have changed from being 10 to 15 minutes long to being three to five minutes long. And those are, in, this is pieces of information that I can look at over time and flip back, you know, years in the past, months in the past, and to be able to say, okay, our medication that we introduced actually did something this time. Um, and that's been a, a very helpful thing. Um, these are two examples that uh, different patients have allowed me to share from uh, a study that we did looking at a uh, ketogenic diet coupled with uh, valproic acid, so Depakote changes. Um, both of these patients were patients with a, a very severe form of epilepsy called myoclonic ecstatic epilepsy, where on any given month, kids were having up to 200 seizures in that month. 
when we initiated ketogenic diet, an amazing thing was that we were using seizure tracker and very careful data collection. We were very clearly able to see that seizures went down with the introduction of the ketogenic diet, which is a really exciting thing. But then for both kids, we noticed that there was this peak and the, the seizures suddenly came back and we couldn't figure out why. And so looking back with our seizure tracker data, with our uh, electronic medical record data, we were able to identify that we had made a subtle difference in their valproic acid um, uh, co-therapy with ketogenic diet. And for both kids, uh, removing valproic acid, getting it out of the way of the ketogenic diet allowed them to return to essentially seizure freedom. And that was something that we were only really able to see by taking that 10,000 foot view and being able to not necessarily be in the moment with each individual change, but looking at all of the changes that had occurred for this patient over a prolonged period of time. And this in general, just not specific to seizure tracker, but just showing uh, to any of the data collection tools that this is really the, the best utilization of it, to be able to take a, a view that isn't just in the moment in, of seizure care um, and to look overall when someone has already been on half a dozen medications or a dozen medications. Is there a shift in seizure type that we can make with medicines? Is there a shift in um, side effects that we can make with medications? And these are things that we can collect specifically with that, uh, with tools like this. Um, kind of the second largest of the uh, epilepsy diaries that I am aware of is My Seizure Diary, um, which is through epilepsy.com, the Epilepsy uh, Foundation of America. Um, they also have tools, the epilepsy diary tool, or my seizure diary tool, excuse me, allows you to log seizures and medicines, um, share diary information with your doctor, same idea, your doctor has to log into a special, their own personal account that you have now uh, shared your information with them that allows them to aggregate data of several patients. Um, it can allow reminders for medications um, and keeping track of appointments. It'll create reports for you similar to the ones that are in seizure tracker that helps you to figure out when, how many seizures you've had in a month, those sorts of things. Um, and then also provide some patient education. Um, uh, this from uh, Kasasa et al. was a, a paper in 2018 kind of looking at different features of the different um, seizure tracking tools. And um, one of the things that I like about seizure tracker is there's a lot of just very simple click buttons that, you know, there's a checkbox that allows you to do things. And then there is a, uh, uh, there's free text that allows you to include additional information. Um, most of the information that is in, uh, to my experience, in um, my seizure diary is free text information um, that allows you to have kind of a more narrative flow. And so I tend to divide my families who really enjoy STEM, so uh, math and engineering and, um, and kind of our more objective patients. They really enjoy using seizure tracker because it creates really good charts and it, it is very um, uh, direct in the information that it's providing. And for those families that are more um, language arts-based families who like to have lots of narrative, um, that uh, seizure diary has been a more uh, useful tool for them um, for putting in additional information about the experience that they're having. Um, my Seizure Diary also is available on Android and app. Um, to my knowledge, they do not have an Alexa option. Um, a seizure tracker does. Um, from a provider point of view, my experience with Seizure Diary is that it has actually been harder for me to access my patient's information, um, but part of that has always been also associated with the patients that specifically choose to use this, that we sometimes had difficulty with the interfaces. Um, one that I am less familiar with is one called Epi Diary uh, that is uh, uh, available internationally and is available in a couple of different uh, languages, including Italian and uh, Spanish. Um, it also has availability in the App Store and in uh, Apple App Store and Google, Google Play. And it actually creates a much more almost simplistic design that it might be more useful when young adults and teens are working on uh, self-management uh, for themselves because it allows them to uh, create um, alerts to um, assist them for uh, uh, control of medications to document uh, seizure medicines and provides this very simple graphic set 
that says I took my medicines, I missed some medicines, I had a seizure free day, I had a seizure, um, that they're to document things like seizure triggers and to do it in such a way that it's just a very rapidly uh, easy visual. Um, this I have not had the experience yet of having anyone to, uh, consistently use it. Um, but this would be information that could be very helpful for a doctor, but we would still then need to, to transcribe it into a different uh, style that would allow us to put it into the medical record more easily. Um, the last program that I looked at was a program called EPSI uh, that was created by Liva Nova, which is the um, uh, Liva Nova are the creators of the Vegas Nerve Stimulator. Uh, it has a lot of the similar features of the other programs that we've talked about is available through Apple and both Android for phone. Um, and all of these also have a compatibility with, um, with uh, desktops as well. Um, it allows to, people to track seizures, medication changes to track triggers. Um, and then also has some information allowing collection of information for things like menses um, and other kind of uh, presence of aura, presence of seizure. Um, and then other life events that may uh, impact seizure frequency. So like having a really busy day, having a pretty sleep day um, that may significantly impact seizures. Looking through things, there are others as well. And quite honestly, at least every few years, there are another one to two seizure applications, uh, epilepsy related applications that allow for additional collection of data. And um, there are other non epilepsy centric apps. So for instance, um, the Children's National uh, Health System has a health app that also has an epilepsy uh, uh, build-in into it um, that allows for tracking and communication specifically within the Children's National Hospital System. Um, things like um, Diet Pal and um, Fitness, My Fitness Pal, they have information that you can use to store information about your seizures in them, though they're not specifically directed to that. They're more directed at general health. Um, and then I have a couple of young adults that are using the Mango Health app, same idea that it's directed towards general health, but helps with seizure medication reminders um, and other things like making sure that you're staying on top of your uh, clinic appointments. So going back over the comparisons, one of the things that's most important is what is, again, what is important for you to be able to communicate and how do you need to be able to keep track of that? For some patients, being able to just keep track of their single seizure type by just, you know, putting literally a tick mark on a, a calendar is sufficient. For others with more complex epilepsy, being able to keep track of everything from what they ate that day to the phases of the moon to how they're feeling to whether or not they took their medications precisely on time versus shifted by an hour, those every single piece of information for them might be important. And sometimes you'll collect everything for a little bit and realize, oh, wait, only these pieces of information are important for me. And then you can shift to, to, um, to evaluating that. One of the difficult things about epilepsy is that it truly is different for absolutely everyone. And so I have had patients with what we call diurnal variations where they are more likely to have a seizure in the morning and be absolutely fine all afternoon and evening. I've had patients who have um, these very large variations in their seizure frequency so that I have some young patients where I know they will be fine three quarters of the year, but for some silly reason, come the month of November, which we still have not been able to figure out, they are going to have a hard time. Or one patient where between February and March is their worst time of year and it's consistent over years and we don't exactly know why, but we know that we can adjust medications specifically during that time and have an impact on their quality of life that lasts for the whole year long. And so in the end, what is the most important kind of seizure diary for you to keep? Whichever one you will use, whichever one fits well with you and that makes sense for you and that you can use on a consistent basis. Um, and then working with your provider, whoever that is and whatever works best for them is going to be really important as well so that you always have a consistent tool for communication. Um, and I know I just did a huge amount of talking and I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to ask questions um, and um, or give critique and feedback. Great. So welcome everybody back to our our uh, main room here. <laughs> so um, thank you. That was that was really 
fantastic overview. Um, I think that it's really clear that there's a lot of options out there. And I, I like, I like on your table when you said paper, is it, you know, like, is it, is it cost-effective? Is it like all these, things, like, is it free? Is it really free? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm guilty of being someone who is slow to, to get on the bandwagon and we have stacks, you know, of notebooks um, and just the power of being able to um, look at trends. Cause it can really start to feel like this week has been so much worse but maybe that's being colored by lots of other things. And in reality, you know, it's the same number of seizures as last week. And, you know, and you might think, oh, I, I haven't given rescue meds in like six months and look back and like, actually it was two months ago. So, you know, time can be very distorted. Um, and, you know, like I was saying in the beginning, you know, I, I come from a public health background. I'm very much a fan of using data for decision-making. And so I wonder if, anybody could talk a little bit more. I mean, Dr. Hughes, that example I loved where you showed like, okay, we could figure out exactly what was going on, you know, with these kids and in interaction with the ketogenic diet. And then if only there were quick answers like that for everything, but, you know, <laughs> but it really speaks to the power of that. And I wonder if um, Rob, you could share an example or maybe Nancy um, of when you used that data and it really helped shift you know, treatment um, or any aspect of care for your for your child. Yeah, I could speak to a couple. I mean, we've had several um, situations, but a couple that stick out um, specifically is like some of the medications that we've trialed. So we've had some that, you know, we think are really beneficial and we're really seeing some good things, but then we're really noticing a pattern that just keeps regenerating from that. Um, and so we found that we've had to come off of that medication. Dr. Hughes will attest to that, you know, and through tracking it through that pattern. But we also, uh, Gabby, have had to look at what other outside factors are there. And that's where our tracker has come into play because we've been able to say, well, maybe he's had this going on, but really they wound up going back to the medication. Um, it has been a great example. And the other thing too is my son um, really has his um, at most events during the night. So we've looked at how, like when he's having his medication and also what he's having to eat in the early evening or halfway through the day and looking at that and what type of foods he might need. So I think that's really been able to help change the way we're doing things. Um, and then the other thing that, and I did, Dr. Hughes touched on this a little bit was picking out how you're gonna track it. I think when we switched over to electronic and I just wanna talk about this, it really helped me as a parent be able to filter what we wanted to track and what was important rather than we we're just writing tons and tons and tons of things. And some of those things really may not be as um, needed or prevalent at the time. So I think that really helped us getting tr transferred over to the electronic. I wanna make sure I mentioned that because that really helped me focus in on where I was supposed to looking at. So thank you. If I can build on Nancy, Nancy, thank you so much for sharing your story too here. I think your your perspective is so important. Um, uh, one of the things that's interesting about collecting data and the detail of data and how you collect it is you're able to look at trends differently, let's say, than we would just writing things down. So you talk about the timing of seizures and, and nighttime seizures and the idea of be just collecting that one data point at the time a seizure happens is so important in making decisions on when therapies are given and how much of the day. I remember, especially in the pediatric population, we had Evan dosing on uh, medications eight times a day because he was metabolizing his, his medication so vastly different during the day. And those were all adjusted for different doses. So you can imagine knowing when those seizures are happening by the time of day, you're able to understand those patterns and clustering of timing. Um, the other thing, and, and to build on what we've benefited from, um, Evan, we noticed had a cycle um, and we didn't, 
we could get a feel for it, but we really didn't have an insight until what of what that cycle was. And the cycle meaning he's going to have a big seizure every four days, or he's going to have a big seizure every 12 days. What we come to find is that when we were collecting the date and the time of his seizures, we were able to look at his data visualizations um, longitudinally, meaning over an extended period of time, and that he was having these very set cycles that were almost predictable. So we could see other things manifesting that would indicate a seizure was going to happen, but we could go to his diary and go and communicate that with his physicians and say, our son is cycling. He's having seizures every 12 to 14 days. And here is the visualization to prove it. And from that, we were able to start treating him uh, aggressively and proactively to prevent seizures from actually happening on that cycle. And the, da the data lets you do that. So it's great to hear, Nancy, your story with that. Um, as well, you know, do you have any comments on just generalizing um, the 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 structured data and how it changes treatments? So the biggest things are exactly what you say. That idea of uh, identifying when you can cycles and identifying patterns within the overall seizure frequency. Some people have absolutely no patterns. And recognizing that is also very important, but many patients do have some pattern that we can start to pick apart um, and then start to adjust treatment. So we have some patients, for instance, that, um, for instance, a very good example of this is catamenial epilepsy, which is when um, patients who um, menstruate will have a, a cluster of seizures or a worsening of their seizure frequency in relation to their menstrual cycle. And when that is the case, and we see that that is consistently occurring, then the correct answer stops being adjusting seizure medicines, and it starts being adjusting that cycle, um, if that is appropriate for that patient in this time, because we can actually help to eliminate that bump in seizure frequency by just stopping the frequency, the intensity of the estrogen progesterone cycles. Um, and that has been, for many of our, our patients, that has actually been a huge benefit for uh, understanding why their seizures vary and fluctuate in the way that they do. Um, for our patients who have specifically primarily nocturnal seizures or who have very specifically um, seizures that are occurring in relation to their medication times, being able to see those medication, medication time and then being able to see seizure time has actually been helpful for both those who are having medication peak effects. So they're getting overdosed on their medicine. And we see that they have this cluster of seizures like an hour and a half after their medicine. That often will tell us that, wait a sec, we, we actually need to dial back the medicine, not increase it. Um, as opposed to those who are having seizures that are happening just before their next medication dosing, which is often that they're bottoming out and running out of seizure medication. And so the, there has been a huge utility to collecting that information, even if it really does feel like, well, they have seizures all the time and they're just, um, there is no rhyme or reason to it. Anything that we can impact and anything that we can change will automatically get you hopefully to a better place from a seizure control standpoint. Yeah, and I was, you know, I'm thinking back, Nancy, you were talking about, um, making how it's kind of challenging to make that transition from paper to electronic. And Rob, I'm sure you've counseled many people on this, if there are things that you want to share that that helped you. Um, I mean, having it on your phone, I'm sure um, makes it very um, a lot easier to just click it in. But any thoughts on that? For me specifically, um, the biggest challenge or the biggest opportunity for me was I felt like I kind of brought everything together again I go back to that because once I once I put it in that electronic area I felt like I had one file instead of stacks of paper everywhere and sifting through and I, and I often go back to we, we were, were still able and we're able to make decisions a little bit better or in a more timely manner because we were able to track it better having it on electronic and I think my challenge was just kind of it's kind of like growing away from 
the paper and pen. Like I felt like I still needed to write it. And I did do that when I first started with seizure tracker. I'm like, okay, I'll just still use my paper and pen for a little bit. And then eventually the paper and pen went away. But I, I feel strongly, I felt like I was more squared off and more put together as I built the trust with the toolkit. But I do think it's, it is a process to transition over as a, from a parent perspective. And it's getting more used to that, to the uh, using the toolkit and the application itself. And having it on my phone, greatest thing ever. <laughs> Jen, I wonder if this is a generational thing. We were straight to paper. We went to pencil and we would carry around notebooks. We were writing on restaurant napkins and stapling them to a notebook. And just so we would have that information. And, um, and I wonder if people are more apt to be using technology than, you know, this was 14 years ago when we launched this, you know, the rudimentary diary it was at the time. So I think it's important to understand that accessing your recording device is important. So uh, if you carry it with you, it's gonna be a lot easier to get data as the seizure happens or directly after the seizure happens. And the data is gonna be more accurate and better for us to make decisions later on. So I'm always a proponent of easy access and record your seizures as they happen or really right after they happen so you don't lose that information. And Nancy brings up this whole timely discussion thing. And I think maybe Dr. Hughes could testify to this, that if we standardize the way we look at this data, it makes our clinic visits so much more effective because you can come in and you know we would, Lisa and I would stand at the clinic room door and not let our doctor leave until we had talked about everything we wanted to talk about. So you can imagine they're, they're under this time pressure to see as many patients as they can in a certain amount of time. And I know we were messing up their schedule for the rest of the day. So, so we would come in and really take our notebooks out and our sticky notes and all of this and spread that all out and try to have this conversation, which was going to take a lot longer than it should have been. And then once we started collecting things electronically, charting them out, or even presenting reports prior to clinic visits, really helped with that timely communication. And then using that valuable time that we have with our physicians to make more educated decisions and talking about ways we can deal with this uh, rather than talking about what's actually happening. I, I absolutely agree with that. And, and not just the timeliness within an actual clinic visit, the discussions that we can have in between clinic visits for top-ups too. Um, one of the wonderful things is I've been able to share that valet access with other people in my clinic group. And so when Nancy says seizure tracker is updated and that's just the, the message that she sends, our triage nurse can go in and go, you know, we made this adjustment this, this many days ago and now we are better, worse or, or indifferent. Um, and, and for epileptologists, that idea of better, worse or the same, of course, certainly helps us to make decisions about medication and, and therapy changes, but Knowing that also lets us then spend additional time on things like what is your quality of life? Did the change that we make, yes, it affected seizures, but how are you feeling? What's happening? Are you extra sedated? Or like all of the other stuff that also is really, really important in just the overall life and care of somebody with epilepsy, not having to actually sit down and, and figure out, you know, okay, there were three seizures that day and maybe it was better and maybe it was worse. That, like you said, that takes up time, that there actually are so many other things that we want to address to help to make somebody's life better with epilepsy, that having that shorthand of, and here's our seizure, seizure data, here is our medication change data, and this is how they sync up, has been um, incredibly helpful for advancing the care of our patients. And obviously, Dr. Hughes, you are like, a brilliant of example, the example of how this could work with a doctor. But I imagine there's doctors that are hesitant to, to do this. I don't know if you've run across them, Dr. Hughes or Rob, that you have to like try to sell people that technology is useful and, you know. Well, so um, 
I, I have the joy of, of working towards getting seizure trackers specifically integrated into our electronic medical record. And so that means starting to train our nurse practitioners, our docs here at U of R on how seizure tracker actually works for those that I haven't already convinced to join um, and to become part of this, this train. Um, and interestingly, everyone agrees that this is a good idea and everyone agrees that this has an intense utility. Their biggest concern uh, are questions like how much extra time is it going to take me? How much extra uh, learning is it going to take them as a physician to learn yet another electronic medical record piece of information? Um, and basically, it, it you know yes, it takes you know a half an hour really to figure out how to access this from a physician point of view, from a family point of view, because there are lots of things that you can do to optimize it. Each of the different um, tools will often take probably, you know, a couple of weeks to really get into the comfort of trying to use and figuring out if it's worthwhile for you. I actually have several patients who tried seizure tracker and it didn't work for them and they've gone back to their paper or they've gone to a different, um, a different tool because it just, it didn't fit with how their brain particularly worked and what information they felt the need to put down. Um, and so from a doc point of view, there aren't all that many of us that are actually against this idea. It's actually having how it fits into a family's point of view that ends up being the biggest choice in what comes next. Yeah, I think the <clears throat> convincing them that it'll save them time down the line probably is a big selling point. Um, and I love that you guys are integrating a seizure tracking kind of system into your clinical care, which is incredible to have different pieces of information and data coming in to help. Um, Rob, can you talk a little bit about your work in trying to uh, integrate um, seizure tracking data into clinical trials and, and um, or electronic tools? In that yeah, um, I'll touch on a few things uh, Dr. Hughes just said. First of all, um, uh, we've always taken the approach of as patients, we need to empower ourselves to educate our physicians as well. So um, adopting these tools and then being able to share um, um, uh, effective data in a meaningful way often sways clinicians to, to understand the value a little bit more. So if their patients use them, bring them in, and they are effective in communicating, or enhancing that communication set, I think that's where we start to sway um, uh, positive viewpoints in, into using these systems. So there's a responsibility as patients to use them and use them effectively and communicate them well to your physicians. Um, uh, Ina, uh, Dr. Hughes mentioned the integration into the clinical workflow. So at Seizure Tracker, we have worked with the largest electronic health record in the US um, to integrate that data directly into the clinic workflow. So when a doctor goes and logs into your electronic health record, there they have access to your Seizure Tracker data. And what's been interesting to watch with that effort at Seizure Tracker is that once we get it into a, a, a hospital or an institution, there's a pretty fast uptake because it's easily accessible. We have one hospital that we integrated with uh, two or three months ago, and they're already spreading it throughout the whole hospital. So into the ED, all the other neurology departments and to the pediatric care departments, general care departments. So they're able to make it accessible across the whole institution and found that just making it accessible and having it there, people uh, can look at the data within the clinical workflow a lot easier. Um, so I think it's maybe a slow process to uptake this technology, but once we start implementing it more and more, I think people are gonna get more comfortable with it, uh, both on the, the patient care provider side and the physician side. Um, one thing Dr. Hughes also came, brought up was uh, the study management. So they ran a study at U of R. This is the first I heard about it. It's so exciting to know that we can build a tool that has enough data standardization or structure in it that it can be used for clinical studies 
um, on a larger small scale. So um, uh, really structuring the data, again, that International Seizure Diary Consortium is about how do we standardize this data to empower ourselves as care providers and patients and our clinicians, but then also how do we improve lives for other people? And through that research effort, we can collect our data and then be able to share it. So we've worked hard at Seizure Tracker to empower our users to share their data with anyone they want, including, so including their clinicians, but also researchers. We have industry partners. So we partner with NeuroPace, which is a, um, a responsive neurostimulator. Uh, NeuroPace actually has direct access to seizure tracker data for their uh, patients who choose to share their data. They link it together and put it right into the clinical workflow for their, um, for their physicians who are managing patients with NeuroPace. So it's, and we were able to do that because we have structured data and it's standardized in a way that's useful across the epilepsy community. So uh, I, I hope I answered your question, Gabby. I think um, we worked really hard to empower our users and the epilepsy community to own and share the data in a meaningful way, not only for individual decision-making, but for understanding epilepsy across uh, the spectrum and the community as a whole. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's, it's really fantastic. Um, I, has, I had one more question that came in um, and then Rob will give you um, the last chance to ask anything <laughs> or chime in. So um, how does a seizure tracking work when your child is away from you, they're at school, do school nurses do something? Do home care nurses do something? Do teachers do something? Or do they just kind of let you know something happened and you entered in later? Um, in my experience, we've done it several different ways. So um, specifically in Seizure Tracker, there's a thing that's called the ballet system where people can be given permission to essentially link to a, 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 an individual's chart um, and they can input data but not take away data, for instance, that there are permissions that the, the primary user can, can use. Um, some of our families have used that for their group home staff, for their nursing staff, for their school nurse staff. Um, others, because they like to have the integrity of the data to themselves, will just ask. So um, we, we definitely request that every single kid who goes to school who has seizures at school have some mechanism for tracking seizures. Sometimes that is unfortunately uh, mandated at the level of the, the school that they have mm -hmm. their own version of this. Um, and, but sometimes we are able to suggest ways for them to do it better um, and to, to give us the information that we want. And so um, when there are uh, usually paper-based seizure tracking at school or uh, through home nurses or through uh, group home nurses, we ask that they share that data with us, which they almost always do. And then families will often input it in personally into their electronic seizure diary or they will just directly share with us. So we have all the home data and then here's the additional school data. Mm -hmm. If I could comment just on one thing too, our, our, um, uh, we used to drop Evan off at, at preschool and we would walk out of the room after dropping him off and look over and he would be having a seizure. And and we knew that his seizures clustered in, in patterns and, and multiple seizures at a time. So we would drop him off at uh, the preschool, walk out, see him having a seizure, come back to pick him up and ask if he had seizures that day. And they'd say, no, we didn't see anything. So we knew he was having those seizures. They were subtle, simple, partial seizures. I think sometimes we have to resign ourselves as care providers to just collect what we can collect, not overburden ourselves, not get too stressed. But if we do it consistently, we can still see those patterns and changes. So you might say, um, uh, you know, I can only do so much, but I'm gonna do so much consistently. And then we can look back because we collected as data and can look at trends that we see those changes when we're doing consistently. So you might say, well, 
my child is having seizures every day. We're having a lot of seizures. Well, maybe I'm just going to collect my seizures three days a week and then compare those seizure counts over a month and say, well, things are better, things are worse. We don't have every seizure, but we don't, you don't want to have the seizure diary become a burden to collect and then just stop. Or maybe you want to stop if things are good or things are bad. It, it's just a representation of what you want to communicate and collect. And I think it's real important to not make this be another stressor that we add to families um, and, and try to make it as easy as possible to collect the best data um, in a meaningful way that lets us communicate that to our physicians to make better therapy changes. Um, uh, so I had something really profound to say after that. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> I did want to ask um, Monica or Nancy about one, one question with, because it's always fun to have users in these dialogues and parents and um, and it's hard not to leverage that discussion. But I wonder when you were talking about it, managing MJ through a seizure diary and communicating specifics about that that weren't necessarily a part of the structured data, how did you communicate customized information or decide what you were co com gonna communicate and move it through that process to actually get it to Dr. Hughes to make an educated therapy decision? So outside that diary, so if not entering individual notes, are you saying is within the diary or are you saying like separate from that? How I guess a little bit of both. I wonder where does the diary fail and what you want to communicate with your position and, and how did you um, accommodate for that? that um, so gap? then when I start to see things, that's when I um, move on to the email to the, the to the system that we use, like the track, the my chart system or my care system, uh -huh. my chart, and that when I start to see like there's a few things that seem to be alerting me on the diary, you know what I mean? Then that's when I kind of drop that note. Seizure tracker is updated, and then that's when she kind of knows something's kind of must be brewing or something that and she pretty much can be spot on to I see her head shaking now that that's where I kind of like all right I think we're all over the map right now so I think some of it is just instinctive for me that I feel like and then I look at it and I'm like but you know we went up on this mat and so my mind starts going so I feel like there's some natural alerts that come if you will Rob that kind of let me know that I need to bring attention to it, if that makes sense. Is that kind of what you're looking for? And then mm -hmm. I usually will put notes though in the seizure tracker, like he um, has four loose teeth or has was diagnosed with an ear infection, things like that, because mm -hmm. so we can look mm -hmm. back and say, oh, he had four seizures in a week and what, and then we say, oh, he had an ear infection. So those things, those little things, but when it starts to escalate to a bigger, mountain or volcano is when I kind of have to go outside of that. Yeah. Does that Thank help? You. Thank you. I want, I want to, if I have a second, I want to go back and comment on, um, and maybe Rob, you can help me with this, but I started to explore the um, Apple Watch with my son to try to track like some activity where I might be able to help me know through his heart rate and things because he's nonverbal like what what is it that maybe his body's doing that could help me know that he's coming into maybe a seizure pattern mm -hmm. but what I wanted to say was uh, he started to wear his apple watch to school so then if school would tell me he was sleeping from noon to two or he was off or he was just kind of groggy I would go to his apple watch and see like what was his heart rate then? And you know what I mean? Kind of explore it that way. And not that I'm assuming there was an exact seizure at that time, but um, back to your point that the school said he didn't have a seizure. I, I was kind of through behaviors that they would say happened at school. I'm like, oh, and they're like, yeah, he was just kind of staring for a little while. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he's not typical for him to have seizures during the day, but I was like finding these things. So I guess my other question to you is, do you ever foresee like a seizure tracker being able to be facilitated through the Apple Watch, like kind of picking things up? Yeah. So yeah. I know that's far, but <laughs> big question. <laughs> um, I can comment a little bit about seizure tracker, but I think this is a great transition into a plug for the upcoming webinars that 
that the deep folks are are hosting over the next month and a half. So um, uh, we are staying away from seizure alerting um, as seizure tracker. We provide a system and we're building out a tool that will allow um, industry partners who want to develop devices and alert to things, leverage seizure tracker as a diary within those alerting systems. Um, we've used a lot of different alerting devices. We had multiple electronics hooked up to Evan over multiple years with varying effectiveness in understanding his seizure activity. Um, our most effective system of understanding his seizures were his service dog, who alerts to his subclinical and clinical seizures as they're in, in, in approaching. So um, we probably won't go down the road of creating a, a, a seizure alert device within Seizure Tracker, but we do have efforts internally to um, empower industry partners who have that as a motivation to link up and leverage a seizure diary system. And I do ask that, thank you, Rep. I do ask that because we've gone through that whole mm -hmm. uh, alerting seizure process and we haven't had success. So that's what made me ask. So thank you so much for that. Gabby, do you wanna uh, just chat about the upcoming webinars and um, yes. how exciting they are to answer some of those additional mm -hmm. questions? Yeah, so um, let me pull this up. So um, first of all, we'll say thank you to everybody for joining and for our guests. Um, it's really fantastic to have such an incredible lineup and discussion. Um, so we, um, on the 23rd is the next in this series on technologies to help manage seizures. And this is um, on seizure monitoring tools. Um, and looking at what's available out there with, uh, and where we could be partnering with Danny Did for that, um, who of course is leading in that space and helping families know what's available. Um, and then we have kind of a follow-up to our Curing the Epilepsy series, um, a, a webinar on looking at the state of epilepsy care and how we as families can make sure that we're getting the highest quality healthcare for our children. Um, <clears throat> and you can get go to register those um, for those at bit.ly slash deep webinars. Um, and the third one, Rob, if you want to talk, you want to share about for a minute, um, then I'd be happy to have you share because you're kind of leading the effort <laughs> to get that one up and running. Yeah, I'll just do a quick plug. I think um, uh, the third webinar in this technology series is really exciting. I mentioned that we have had a strong relationship with the, the research, the epilepsy research community, but what we're finding when we collect this type of digital data is that we're able to understand and identify patterns in people's seizures. And there's been numerous publications recently that collect, that are based around data um, that is collected in this manner that is is really understanding how people cycle and and looking at can we actually forecast when people's seizures are going to happen and what do we do when we have that information how do we treat do we treat differently clinically for that so the last of this three-part technology series um, is based on well we have this data uh, where can we really push uh, this technology to go to help us um, not only understand seizures, but then to treat better and um, preemptively possibly with understanding seizure uh, pat, um, cycles and, and forecasting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really exciting um, to be looking at kind of the emerging technology and what is possible in the future um, in terms of predicting and hopefully potentially even preventing seizures. Mm -hmm. So um, we're really excited about that. Um, and I also want to just point out that this technology series um, we're doing um, was partially uh, funded with an educational grant from Norellis. Um, so we thank them for partnering with bringing these really important conversations to families. So 
Um, this will be uploaded and online pretty soon, and we welcome feedback. Feel free to reach out if you have additional questions. And thanks, everybody. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy your evening. Thanks, Ina. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. That was awesome. You guys rock. <laughs> <laughs> it was, that was fantastic. Yeah. 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 Nancy's just.